Hello, I'm Chris Wagner. Uh, I'm glad to be here with you and talk with you today about motivational interviewing and how it fits into vocational rehabilitation. Um, I am a certified rehabilitation counselor and clinical psychologist. I'm glad to join you today. Um, today we're going to review the basic framework of motivational interviewing. Uh, we'll talk about how it fits in the, the vocational rehabilitation context, um, focusing primarily on the fundamentals of the approach and the practice uh, and on elements that I, I hope you can incorporate into your practice uh, directly after today. Obviously becoming uh, highly skilled at this approach like any other takes practice and, and training and feedback. Um, but I think you'll find that uh, most likely a lot of what's involved in motivational interviewing, if you're not familiar with it already, uh, will fit with the, the way you naturally practice anyway. Uh, MI is used across a number of settings in addiction counseling, mental health counseling, VR, uh, in nursing or bedside in hospitals, in criminal justice, even in teaching. Um, so it's an approach that's, that's pretty flexible. Um, it can be used as a counseling approach, but it also can just be a way of, of interacting with people and having conversations that help them uh, figure out really what the best path forward for them is and um, use their own strengths and, and leverage those strengths to, to move forward uh, towards a more fulfilling life or a particular outcome um, as broadly or narrowly as the situation uh, leads us to focus. And MI has, has kind of grown and developed over the years, but it's never really lost that, that fundamental um, kind of simple element to it. Uh, of just really sitting down beside somebody, um, conducting an interview, right? So uh, looking at something together with them, almost like you're paging, uh, thumbing through, um, you know, a picture album that they have and kind of looking at their lives side by side with them. So part of the challenge with MI is even if it's not particularly complex, it's sometimes not so easy to do. So in our settings, we often have a lot of pressures, we have deadlines, we're expected to uh, manage large uh, caseloads, um, close cases, have positive outcomes. And because of that, um, we often can want to kind of just rush right in and focus on uh, setting up a goal, making a plan, and, and working with somebody tw toward that end. And sometimes that goes great. Um, and other times, uh, people get caught up and people start to kind of drag their heels or push back. Um, and so motivational interviewing is designed to deal with that particular issue. So how to work with somebody in a way uh, that they feel respected, supported, um, and how we can bring our expertise and our knowledge into that situation um, in a way that doesn't get pushback or resistance. So today what we're going to talk about is um, what is motivation? How does it fit in voc rehab? Uh, what gets in the way of changing? We'll look at what is the essence, what are the fundamental aspects of motivational interviewing, including the relationship uh, or the spirit of the approach, uh, how we set things up uh, in, when, when we interact with people. We'll look at the communication methods that we rely on in this approach, and we'll focus on the, the aspect of MI which really strives to establish momentum towards change. Um, and then we'll just do a quick review of how all that fits together in a, a sequence of processes that kind of roll out in time, again, depending on whether we have long-term or a single conversation with, with someone, we can kind of roll these things out. So. Okay, so first let's take a look at motivation and VR. So motivational issues are nothing new in uh, voc rehab, right? So you see this 50 years ago, uh, there were studies being done and one in particular looked at clients across five states and interviewed the, their counselors and counselors identified motivation as a primary barrier to outcomes, even at then. So even at that time, rehabilitation counseling was, was a bit ahead in identifying motivation as an interpersonal phenomenon. 
It wasn't just a, a, an issue of drive states or need states, which is how the motivational theories were primarily oriented at that time, um, but was something that, that could be affected and it was in the context of inter, interpersonal relationship. Uh, at that time, psychology, psychiatry still viewed motivational challenges as deficits or pathologies uh, to be fixed. Uh, addiction counseling viewed it as um, just uh, kind of the fundamental nature of problems of, of people who had addiction problems, uh, while rehabilitation counseling was already moving away from uh, kind of a blaming the client, putting the burden on the client to have uh, positive motivation or have significant motivation, and was challenging us to look at ourselves and what is our own contribution uh, to the situation when it seems like clients are unmotivated. So let's move forward. Uh, rehabilitation counseling contributed to and embraced the person-centered movement, uh, still does. Um, and VR went beyond uh, personal self-acceptance to focusing on the fundamental rights of people, uh, to have self-determination, uh, not only in society, but in their right to be recognized uh, for their strengths and contributions. So there's always been a, a bit of a uh, advocacy, uh, sociological element to rehabilitation counseling. Um, so motivation in VR has long been seen as fundamental, um, something that could be supported by others, but really only maximized by people themselves. Here's, a, here's one definition of motivation. Right? So motivation is about movement, change, um, an intention to put effort towards moving in a particular direction, towards a particular goal or outcome, um, towards a better uh, life, or, of course, in VR, towards a specific job. And motivation is, can be seen as kind of the fuel in the engine that, that really propels uh, people moving forward. I like this model of motivation, this tripartite model of three different elements of motivation. This was developed in uh, a work setting. It was really looking at what are the fundamental motivational elements involved in workers being happy in their jobs, teams working well together, um, and increasing productivity uh, in the workplace. And as you can see there, the, the three elements are direction, effort, and persistence. Right? So to be motivated, there has to be not just energy, but a, a direction, a goal, either something you're moving towards, something you move away from. Um, sometimes it can be vague as just as vague as a, a hope um, that things could be better, that I could feel better, I could feel more productive. And other times it's a very clear goal. So with that, of course, what's important is that people have a consistent aim, a consistent direction and not keep going kind of back and forth, getting stuck, going one way for a while, one way for another while. So the second element there is effort, right? So a lot of people have good ideas that they don't necessarily bring to fruition. Um, and there's that, you know, blood, sweat, and tears part of it, right? It's putting energy toward it, really getting momentum established, um, not just having the idea of writing the novel, but actually sitting down and, at the page or at the computer and, and putting in the time. Um, the third element is persistence. Right? So this is an interesting one. It's one that's uh, often undervalued uh, in our society. Um, and when people are thinking about making changes, it's often one they overlook or don't give enough uh, credence to. So, of course, many changes that people make, they can set a goal, they can move toward it, they can get excited for a while, and then they can kind of lose momentum. Right? And this is the case whether it's exercise, uh, whether it's changing diet, whether it's changing sleeping habits, interpersonal relationships, or you know, communication styles. Um, and certainly it's the case in VR, where people can often get excited about a particular outcome, get going, and then kind of uh, just lose momentum after a while. In motivational interviewing, of course, we, we don't ignore external motivations, right? So most of us 
uh, if we stopped getting our paycheck, probably wouldn't come to work as often as we do, or maybe quite as early as we do, or stay as long as we do. Right? So uh, we don't ignore external motivations, rewards, uh, punishments, or things that, that affect um, what people do. But we're particularly interested in their internal motivations, their intrinsic uh, desire to make things better for themselves. Right? So we're all motivated in this way. Um, we want to feel like we have a choice. Or we're motivated when we do have a choice. When we do something somebody else decides for us, um, we might do it, uh, we might do it well, but it's not really coming from the heart, and so we won't necessarily stick with it or approach it as creatively as we, we would otherwise if it's something we chose, something we wanted to do. Um, we're motivated by competence. We want to be good at what we do. Right? It feels good to um, have a job well done and know that we contributed. Um, in addition to that, uh, we're motivated by a sense of meaning, of purpose, of contribution, of having it matter that we showed up, that we, we put in the effort, that we stuck it out. Um, and that often drives us forward um, to a point where we then uh, have another kind of motivation, internal motivation kick in, which is based on our sense that we have moved forward, that we have made progress, that we are moving towards mastery. Um, so our clients are no different. So just to give the kind of basic overview, um, external motivations tend to be helpful at getting things started. And then internal or intrinsic motivations are often the things that really help people carry through, get creative, stick it out, find, uh, be motivated to brainstorm when there are challenges or to, to find new ways. Right, so there's no different. It's no different with our clients. Um, they decide to pursue a job. Um, it's not something we do to them. Um, they're motivated by doing well, being good, feeling a sense of competence, um, and like all of us, uh, want their lives to have meaning, to have purpose, um, and to see that uh, as things move forward, they're not just doing the same old, same old, but actually growing and developing uh, in their abilities. So how we define VR affects how much we tap into these intrinsic motivations. Um, sometimes our pressures for closures to manage large cases may set us up to kind of minimize focusing on some of these elements uh, and driving people towards external outcomes, which they may go along with, but which, uh, you know, again, may not uh, last. Okay, so in VR, what are some of the motivational elements, right? So clients are obviously managing a number of medical or physical issues and challenges. Um, there's ups and downs, the slings and arrows. You know, one day you can feel well, another day is much more challenging. One day you can do certain things easily, quickly, um, and other days they come harder and slower. And it's just a normal part of managing work uh, with a disability. Clients often have issues of adjusting to their disability. Uh, who am I now? What can I do? What are my limits? How do people see me? How do I fit in? And this can affect their motivation towards employment. Um, as well as, depending on the situation, uh, they're sometimes adjusting to cognitive changes, right? So things don't come as easily to me. I can't hold as much in my head. My, my thoughts don't come as quickly. So whether that's a disability-related, aging-related, uh, you know, or just from fatigue, uh, or maybe the distraction of trauma, um, sometimes people have to deal with that, and it gets in the way of um, being really highly energetic about pursuing a different outcome. Returning to work, of course, am I going to fit in? What's it going to be like? Is this a new setting? Will I, you know, have the same kind of relationships that I've had before? Um, and also, of course, recovering from addictive behaviors, whether they're addictions or whether they're, it's simply the effects of medications that people take. Um, or with some of the people that we work with, of course, there was an addictive behavior that was involved in an acquired disability. And so there may be shame, there may be difficulty to get over there. So these are some of the things that, that we have to deal with. 
let's look at what gets in the way of changing, right? So what we'd really like is that once something's clear for somebody, they pursue it with vigor, right? But often there's some things that, that are obstacles um, to get around and get over, right? So for any of us in any setting, some of the things that get in the way of change, uh, uh, maybe somebody else's idea, and to us it just doesn't really seem like uh, the, the idea that somebody else has for us is, is that important, or is necessarily that important right now, you know, what we want to do right now. Often uh, we enjoy how things are, or even if we don't enjoy them, we can be comfortable. We're, we're used to them. They're normal. We know what they are. We know kind of how day, the day-to-day -day life goes. And change um, often involves trying to do something different and not being really sure how it's going to turn out or what we're going to lose. So it's obviously difficult to make a change. Our brains are wired to do the same thing uh, tomorrow that we did today and the same thing today that we did yesterday. Um, another challenge is that it takes time. Right? So new habits, you don't just get up and decide to be different. It actually takes time to change your neural pathways, to change your habits, to change how you go through your day, and that's a challenge. There's this issue of reactance. So reactance is a technical term. Um, but all it really means is I have my personal space. Right? I have my physical space and I have my volitional, uh, my own kind of uh, emotional space. And reactance is when somebody feels like we've stepped into their space to kind of push them around a little bit. And I don't know if you've ever experienced this where maybe you're in an argument with someone and partway through you realize maybe they're right and you're wrong, but you just stick to the argument anyway. That comes from a, a sense of reactance, right? That we're going to protect our own uh, self-esteem and our own ability to make choices, right or wrong. And sometimes that gets in the way of, of us making changes. Often people are demoralized, right? Uh, life has uh, thrown them a curveball and things are difficult looking ahead. So there's also the fear of failure. What if I really put my effort into this and it doesn't work out? How am I going to feel? How am I going to look to others? What's that going to mean? What does that mean about me? Have I lost it? You know. So these kinds of things will be in people's heads. In motivational interviewing, we, we tend to bundle these together into the concept of ambivalence. So ambivalence, of course, ambi, two directions, or two, and valence is direction. So at the same time, uh, we have coexisting inside us a desire to go one direction, desire to go another direction, a desire to move, a desire to stay still. And in MI, we look at that as a, as a way for us to think about client dilemmas and help focus the, uh, us um, so that we can help them kind of get through that or get around or resolve their ambivalence. So some of the specific obstacles to change in VR Right. So I'm sure you've all had somebody who doesn't really understand what VR is, uh, what the purpose is, how we go through it, why you can't just place me in the job that I want or in the career pathway that I want. They may not understand that it involves uh, assessing skills, assessing fit, uh, working on placement, developing skills, etc. And so that obviously can get in the way. One that's well known to everyone is that uh, people have a potential loss of benefits when they get involved in, the, in uh, VR services. And even if there is no actual threat to that, the people often fear a loss of benefits. They fear losing um, a sense of support and being kind of left in a challenging situation in the same way that any of us would. So another challenge is information overload. There's a lot to answer, there's a lot to think about, there are forms to, to fill out, there are new processes, considering new jobs, considering new options, and sometimes it's just overwhelming to people and they tend to put on the brakes a little bit. Of course, people get caught up in their own head. 
right? People get, we, get, we get caught up in our thoughts. We have trouble taking in information. We have trouble uh, kind of connecting to other people. And this uh, can often happen uh, in VR settings um, as people uh, don't really know what's going to happen and, and don't feel in control of it. And when that happens, people can often retreat inside. These, these kind of um, thoughts, I'm sure, are quite common. Uh, and so I'm sure you've run across them, right? Will I be able to perform well with my disability, with the, the different way that I am able now and the different ways that I interact with the world? How will that turn out for me? Right? How will I fit in? How will people see me? Will it be accepted? What happens if... I'm doing well now, but uh, I have some struggles later on. If I move down this pathway, um, am I going to put myself at risk in some way? Right? And then, of course, while society has more positive messages around disability now than in the past, it's still a struggle. And people struggle with wondering if they are wanted, wondering if they will be included. Um, if they will be accepted, and if their contributions will be noticed. So these things all get in the way of change. In MI, we tend to think about, uh, again, all these issues in terms of ambivalence. So ambivalence is any mixed feelings or thoughts, but we particularly focus on this in the format of one side of a person is interested, uh, wishes for, desires, hopes for, or just feels like they need to make a change in a positive direction. And another part of them um, is unsure about it or doesn't necessarily want to have to give things up, um, isn't sure if the payoffs are going to be worth the effort. And, and people tend to think about one, then think about the other, go round and round, and then eventually just get tired of thinking about it and stop. And so motivational interviewing is designed to help people look at this ambivalence and kind of uh, work through it. Um, we used to talk about resolving it. I guess some people still talk about that. Um, I have found that's not necessary. Um, often resolution of ambivalence is too high of a goal. All I need is enough of the person's momentum in the direction of positive change that they're willing to, to give it a try and take a step forward. Um, so one of the ways that we can think about ambivalence is in terms of these different kinds of conflicts that somebody might have, the different ways they can perceive their dilemma or experience their situation. So you can see one here, the approach-approach con uh, conflict. This is like the kid in the candy store. You can't eat it all, but you want it all, right? I want to get back to work now, and at the same time, I want a job or a career that suits me better, gives me more opportunity. I want both at the same time, and, and so people can struggle with that a little bit. The avoidance, avoidance, or avoid, avoid conflict is when I don't want either thing, right? Between a rock and a hard place or the devil and the deep blue sea. I don't want to keep doing what I've been doing, but I also don't want to have to start all over again. And people can get caught up in that one too. Sometimes people have an approach avoidance conflict with a single um, outcome or a single goal, right? I want to try something new, but I don't want to fail. And so when someone's in that mindset, it can kind of be start, stop. It's not necessarily different directions choosing between, but just do I have the energy to go forward? Do I have the confidence that I can make it happen? And then there's the big one, right? The double approach avoidance conflict. I'm sure there can be triple and quadruples too, right? But this is when there are multiple competing directions that a person might choose or goals they might choose, and yet, each of them has some pros and cons about it, and they can kind of jump around from one thing to the other and um, really just get kind of overwhelmed and confused. So VR, what are some of the signs of ambivalence? So sometimes people express it directly. I just don't know what I want to do. I have mixed feelings. A kind of part of me feels one way and another part feels another. Um, but often people don't share that, either because they're not uh, especially tuned into it or because they feel like it's uh, stigmatized in some way. That it wouldn't be acceptable for me to share that I really am not sure if I want to do this, even if it's good for me. Right? 
And so we might see them uh, in terms of external signs, right? We can see ambivalence through missed appointments, um, somebody showing up at a job interview with inappropriate clothing, um, times when people are struggling with taking their medication, not because of side effects, but maybe sometimes due to an internal ambivalence about um, acknowledging a situation they're in or being willing to um, accept that medication is helpful. So another way you might see it is when somebody's dissatisfied with every single option that you might come up with them, right? And we've all been at this place. We're just, you know, I'm not gonna take it. Whatever it is you've got for me, I don't want it, right? And this is because there's an ambivalence, something about uh, not necessarily each of those particular options, but about the process of having to choose something or, or having to give up something in order to move forward. Of course, we can see ambivalence uh, interpersonally. People are disengaged when they get oppositional with us, uh, when people delay doing things or justify not doing things, um, when people get passive or people seem hopeless. These are all signs of ambivalence. So the important thing here in motivational interviewing is these are normal. We respect these. These are not to be pathologized. These do not mean somebody's unmotivated. These do not mean a problem in them. They're about a normal process that's going on that, that we want to help someone through. Okay. We've talked about motivation, how it fits in voc rehab. Uh, and some of the issues that get in the way of people just kind of naturally changing and that help that kind of influence them to be stuck and to have challenges in moving forward. So let's take a little bit of look at motivational interviewing and how this approach uh, attempts to help people with that. So again, the three elements that we look at here are what's the, the nature of the relationship or the spirit of our encounters or interactions with people? Uh, what particular communication methods do we use and which ones do we avoid? And then how do we shape conversations so that we help people establish momentum to change from the inside rather than uh, coming at things from the outside and having them feel persuaded or pressured into change? Okay, so just a very simple definition. Motivational interviewing is a collaborative goal-oriented conversation about change. What we're trying to do here is come across in a way that it's just person to person. So our, our professional environments always set us up in kind of a hierarchical position. People are coming to us. We're being paid to help them, right? So whether somebody comes um, entirely of their own volition or you know, through some sort of external guidance or coercion. Um, in the situation, naturally, we're the professional, we are seen as the expert, and there's this kind of hierarchical element. And so what we're trying to do in MI is even that as much as we can. Right? We're not trying to pretend we're not professionals. We're not trying to pretend that we don't have some expert knowledge or that we don't have um, some ability to, to help guide them in ways that, that uh, they might have difficulty finding on their own. But we try to keep it collaborative and we try to be um, on an even level with them. So the spirit of motivation ought to be. So the essence of how we want to interact, is just to, to take this and expand it out a little bit. Um, we want to be partners. Right? We want to approach this as I'm in it, you're in it, we're in it together, and um, I'm not trying to make you do something, and it's not just about um, you making effort, I need to make effort. It's not just about us looking at what you're doing, um, but it's also about uh, kind of taking a look at what I'm doing too. And you know, give me feedback anytime I do something that doesn't seem helpful, um, or seems like I'm pressuring you or pushing you or some way, you know, let's really be in this together. The second element is acceptance. Right? So what I really need to do when I'm working with someone is accept them wholly, completely. Right? It doesn't mean when I'm accepting that I necessarily think they have always made the best choices. I certainly haven't always made the best choices. Right? It doesn't mean necessarily that um, 
I go along or I agree with everything they say. But the point is, I need to look at this person that I'm working with always as an equal or ideally even above me, right? That's somebody I can learn from, that's somebody I can take ideas from, I can look to them um, for inspiration myself. And this kind of acceptance, this kind of really uh, being patient with uh, times when people feel like they don't want to participate, times when people are unsure, or even when people are a little defensive or argumentative. Um, this acceptance is a really critical aspect of, of using it, I would, in those circumstances. The third is compassion, right? So in MI, uh, I want to be willing and eager even to kind of get into someone's pain with them, to be there with them, to not be impatient, to not uh, be dismissive of things that from the outside maybe look small, but when you're on the inside can be large and can be uh, challenging or frightening. Right? So part of compassion is me being committed to keeping our focus on what's best for the person from their point of view, not trying to push them in the direction that I think they should go. And then the last part of the spirit of motivational intervening is evocation. So what we try to do is keep our focus on eliciting, evoking, uh, kind of going fishing uh, for ideas with them, right? Not trying to, to push ideas in, not trying to provide a lot of suggestions. It's not that we're non-directive and never give suggestions or, or share information in a way that you know, we'd like them to consider. Uh, but in general, what we're doing is trying to bring as much forth that's within the clients as possible, rather than kind of look at installing some sort of motivation or, or ideas. In MI, we, we try to constrain our communications to this um, acronym ORS, right? Open questions, affirmations, reflections, and summaries. So as much as possible in motivational interviewing, I'm using reflective listening and I'm trying to hear what they say, summarize it, and balance that with questions where again I'm eliciting from them or evoking from them their ideas. I want to avoid persuading, pressuring, confronting, warning them about outcomes, right? We will give advice but generally we do it with permission. Right? We're gonna ask somebody ahead of time, hey, I have an idea that I think you might wanna consider. Um, if you don't, that's okay, but I have this. So rather than just jump in and even if something's a good idea, potentially poison somebody against that idea, we're careful about how we, we do that. So we'll take just a, a little look at these, these four elements. So first, open questions, right? Closed questions uh, are questions that are often narrow, we're looking for a specific answer, so they narrow somebody's focus. Often fact-based, information-based um, questions. You see here, did you apply for the job? Are you motivated? Did you fill out the resume? When did you first do this? Or when did you first try that? Um, there's nothing wrong with closed questions, and, and often we need information, but the function of them is to kind of set up a relationship where we're kind of in an expert role. We ask the question, you give the answer. I'll ask the question, you give the answer. And it, and it sets up um, a style of interacting that doesn't lead in the direction that I'm most interested in motivational interviewing, which is getting somebody to creatively brainstorm uh, possibilities, right? So open questions tend to do more of that. How might you like things to be different? Give me, you know, share your dream with me. How could you go about accomplishing that? How could you... How do you see yourself um, moving forward in your career? Right? What might get in your way? What might cause some setbacks? How can you get around those obstacles when they pop up? So these kinds of questions, rather than, than searching for a particular answer, put somebody, they broaden the focus and they get somebody kind of thinking, imagining, and they keep us on the same level again, rather than us uh, being above and looking for specific information. In MI, we try to keep about half of our questions or more to open questions. So again, there's, it's not like uh, closed questions are, are forbidden or there's anything wrong with them. We just try to limit them so that people don't start to feel like we're interrogating or that we're kind of uh, standing above them. Affirmations are the second part. Now, affirmations are a particular uh, 
statements that we might make towards people. They're often uh, overlap with reflections where we're, we're sharing our perspective on, or sharing our impression of what we think somebody says. Affirmations don't have to be verbal, right? So we can be affirming with people just by showing up on time, being friendly, giving them our full attention, not rushing, not distracting. All of that is affirming and that helps people not only feel respected, but uh, feel more motivated to, to get involved and, and move forward. Specific affirmations, though, you see the examples here, right? These are noticing positive things about people. Noticing times when they put effort towards something that they may not give themselves credit for or that someone else might not have noticed. Um, noticing when they're living by their values in a situation when it'd be easy to kind of just, you know, sweep things under the rug. Noticing times when they're using their strengths to move forward. So to do affirmations well, it means I really have to be thinking in a positive way, in an optimistic way about somebody and looking for those, you know, those pieces of gold, to be kind of a treasure hunt, looking for times when um, I can give them credit. So affirmations are not quite the same thing as approving or praising or cheerleading, right? These tend to be things where we're coming from the outside and kind of above. Where with an affirmation, what I'm often looking by, looking at is just noticing um, how somebody is being their best self and kind of giving them credit for that. What affirmations tend to do is um, help motivation by bringing more positive emotions in, right? We all like to feel appreciated. We all like to feel noticed and the, and the things that we didn't draw attention to but did well that somebody else, somebody else saw that, right? and mentions it to us. So one thing about affirmations is um, they're valuable, um, and yet we can also overdo it, right? So we want to be careful not to get into cheerleading or really something that can come across sometimes as being patronizing to people. It's not like we're standing over them and patting them on the head. It's again, we're, we're with them and kind of looking for things we respect, admire, look up to, can learn from. Okay, reflections. So reflections are um, just our attempt to either check, did I hear you correctly, uh, help somebody just to kind of verify that I heard them, kind of anchor down what they said. And this is the, a simple reflection. You can be paraphrasing and just uh, kind of, sometimes you can even just pick one aspect of what somebody said to help focus them on that. And then there are complex reflections. So I don't, I don't especially love the, the word complex uh, or the, the label complex reflections because these aren't meant to be complicated. It's not like they're supposed to be difficult. What a complex reflection is just simply, as I was listening to you and putting myself in your shoes, I imagined right this. I imagined that, that this is important to you. This seems like a value of yours. Or um, I imagine you felt like this. It seemed to me like that really upset you or that really inspired you or it excited you. And so what I'm doing with that is just reflecting what I've noticed in the person that's beyond what they've said. Right? So this helps when we use complex reflections or deeper reflections for things not to just go around in circles. So one of the challenges people have with reflections is if you don't do it well, they annoy people, right? Because it's just nobody wants to have a parrot repeating them, right? So I do a little bit of that early on, just checking in when I'm first getting to know somebody to make sure I understand what they're saying. And then over time, we kind of branch out a little bit for that, start to fill in the blanks, start to guess what's behind it, uh, what's underneath it for the person. And what this does as we go, as we go along is it helps them, um, often people, when we're first working them, are, are very narrowly focused on a problem or a specific situation or feeling dissatisfied or feeling um, um, not very hopeful. And as we reflect the bigger picture, it helps broaden their perspective and helps get them um, to relate to us just person to person, kind of outside of the thing that um, they may feel particularly vulnerable about. So just a couple other uh, types of reflection that we use in motivational interviewing. Uh, Double-sided reflection is just simply acknowledging both sides of ambivalence, right? On the one hand, you'd like to do this. On the other hand, you're not so sure about it, right? 
And just, again, what I mentioned before about ambivalence is what happens is people often go back and forth and back and forth. And all we're doing with a double-sided reflection is we're saying, well, both things are happening at the same time, right? Both aspects of you um, exist. You want this and you don't want this, right? You, you'd like to have this, but you'd also like to have that. And so rather than having the person bounce back and forth in their mind between them, it's just pulling it all together into, into one piece. Now, one, uh, one quick little trip of, trick about double-sided reflections is try, if it's a, uh, a situation where there's a positive and a negative or a motivation to change but a fear or a regret or um, lack of hope about it, try to end on the positive side, right? So you're not really, again, listen to the difference between you kind of like to do this, but you're not really sure you can, right? Versus you're not really sure you can do this, but you really want to, you'd really like to, right? So the one that we end on is the, the feeling that we leave the person with and the thing that they're more likely to, to explore and to remember. So we want to end on the positive. Metaphors is just a, a form of reflection where we're, we're taking the details of somebody's situation, trying to put them into an image or sometimes a saying, right? And they can be very simple. It can be, you know, you're swimming upstream or it feels like you're kind of walking around in quicksand some days or, you know, you're determined you're going to get to the top of that mountain. So again, it can, it, they can be silly and maybe get a little patronizing if you use them too much or if you stretch them too far. But often uh, clients experience this as, okay, you really get me and you really get where I'm coming from. Right? And that sometimes just having that image uh, connects with people in a way that words and details uh, don't. Right? So one thing that images do with, for people is as they're kind of going through their daily lives and running into struggles, often the image or a saying or something simple like that can really help them break out of the rumination or break out of, uh, kind of see the moment for what it is and the opportunity. This is why you, you'll have metaphors used a lot in uh, recovery communities, slogans or sayings, you know, one day at a time, um, whatever it might be. These, these, these things, uh, when a person's in a situation that's either uh, potentially overwhelming or is tempting them to do something they don't want to do or to not do something that they ought to do, then these kind of having these metaphors, images, um, or sayings um, can really help them get through those moments. The last one is a reflection with a twist. This is just one that's out there. Um, I don't normally use things like this uh, very often because people can, they can come across maybe as um, kind of reverse psychology or, um, you know, feel, if you don't do it really well, feel like you're being a little sarcastic with people. But that said, the notion is to take some resistance they have or some um, refusal that they're making and reframe it into a strength, right? So you, um, you know, you clearly are somebody who's not going to be pushed around, right? You, you, to you, you're going to be a full partner in anything that happens here, right? You're not going to take what I say and just do it. You're not going to have me push you into a job you don't want. You're going to make sure to hold me accountable to, you know, helping you move in a direction that you really want to move in. So this is just a way where you take a reflection, we agree with some aspect, and then um, uh, put a little twist on the end towards the positive side. The last of the ors is summaries. Right? So these are complicated, uh, but they can be easy to forget to do. So a summary is just simply helping the client remember the big picture of a conversation uh, that we've had. Um, if, if I've been going along reflecting what they say. I'm trying to remember those things in a summary is often just bringing some of the, the reflections that really hit the mark with them uh, and, and putting them together in a row to kind of summarize what we covered today. Um, one way that I think about doing summaries is define what's the situation, what's the dilemma today that the person might be struggling with, share both sides of the ambivalence, and then end, of course, on the change side. Um, and if I, I have a sense that they seem to be tilting or tipping towards uh, making a change, or even if they, w they seem like they want to be thinking about it more or they want to explore more, then I'll end with that in the summary. Okay.
We've talked about the communication methods. Now I want to talk a little bit about how we establish momentum towards change in MI. One of the ways that we do this um, is really carefully listening to um, each thing a person says. Right? And listening in the middle maybe of uh, somebody feeling unsure, hopeless, maybe somebody complaining, in the middle of all that, listening for anything that they say that's positive towards change. So often people are very positive towards change, and this is an easy task. But even when somebody's negative, what I'm trying to do is not focus so much on exploring um, the things that they're finding difficult, the things they're afraid of. I certainly want to accept those and explore them a little bit, just so I can understand them. But then really be listening for uh, things they say that might be positive towards change. So there's a number of categories here, and you don't need to worry about all of them. Um, if you're a person who carries uh, categories around in the way, you know, as you interact with people, and that's the way you think about things, that's fine. I tend to be a little more simpler, and I just listen for anything that's positive, right? So these two categories here, uh, the big category is preparatory. So the kind of early things that somebody might be thinking or saying along the way to change, I might like to, I could, right? You know, maybe I ought to, maybe there's some things I could get out of it. Um, maybe I really need to. Maybe it's just gotten to the point where I need to make a change. So, so I'll, listen, I'll listen for those things, and I want to I hear them and what somebody says. Later on, then, the kind of mobilizing change talk is actually moving towards action, making commitment to do something, getting started, taking steps. So what we're trying to do with this is really elicit and evoke their internal motivations, right? So not just argue on the outside, here's what could be better for you, but help them feel it and help them think about it. You don't have to respond to any particular category here. Just listen for anything positive towards change. Now, one of the nice things about change talk, in, in motivation interview, there's the, the negative side, which is called sustained talk, which is somebody just saying, uh, I don't really want to. I don't think I can. Um, I don't think I should have to. Um, I'm not going to. So those are all sustained talk, right? So a nice thing that we found from research is that you don't have to get somebody to the point of high levels of change talk, right? Somebody doesn't have to be, yay, rah, I'm excited about this, I want to go. What matters is the, the, the trajectory or the change from where they start to where they are at the end of a conversation or at the end of working together, right? So somebody could be very negative, and then as you're talking about them, they get just a little less negative. That's important momentum. That's movement towards change, and you want to notice that, right? So again, we don't have to, to push somebody to be really excited, just get them kind of moving forward towards change. One of the mistakes that people make with change talk is pushing too quickly towards the mobilizing change talk, right? Jumping in and trying to get commitment, trying to get action, trying to get people moving when they're not ready to do it yet. Um, we often have pressures on us to, to get outcomes, and so we're looking to get people to buy into things, right? So there's a, the challenge is when somebody feels pushed or they feel like we're doing it to them, they'll put on the brakes. Remember that reactance that we talked about earlier. Um, one of the quotes we like in motivation interviewing is from a guy who's a horse trainer, Monty Roberts, who has this saying, uh, act like it'll take 15 minutes and it might take all day. Act like you have all day and you might be done in 15 minutes, right? So this idea that Change doesn't happen step by step often. Often it kind of sits and brews and then it unfolds, right? And that when we um, come across as really patient and not in a hurry at all, often clients move along much quicker than when we come, along, come across in a way that we are emphasizing it's important to get moving forward. Okay, so change talk. One thing we can do is ask for it, right? So we want to hear it, so just ask. What might, you know, why might you want to start working again? What do you feel comfortable doing? What do you feel most confident about? How could it help you to get back into a job, get back into a workplace? Um, what might happen if you don't? Like, what are you concerned about long term if you don't start working? Right? So we can just ask that, and this is a way to get people talking um, positively about change. And then, of course, whenever we hear it, we want to reflect it, right? So. 
you really want this to happen, you can almost taste it. This is really coming alive for you. Right? So hear these things and don't just move to the next step, but actually stop and reflect them and, and kind of revel in the moment, enjoy the moment with them a little bit. You seem really confident about this. Right? You can imagine several ways life can be better. Um, you're a little concerned if you don't get doing this that, that things could kind of start to slip or go downhill. So listen for these things, ask for them, and then reflect them. And this is how we get our conversations um, having momentum towards change. Okay, the last thing we're going to cover today is the four processes of motivational interviewing. So we've talked about so far is motivation and kind of how people get caught up in this dilemma of ambivalence and the, the general ways that we go about in MI with establishing a, establishing a relationship, with communicating in a way um, that naturally elicits change, and then with intentionally focusing on change in our conversation. What we're going to do now is look at how do those pieces fit together and how do they kind of roll forward. So again, MI can, is an accordion. It can be in a single conversation. This can be over several sessions over time. Um, and yet still what we do is try to roll forward through these four processes. This is a little small on there. I hope you can see it. Right? So the first process is engaging. Right? So it's just simply getting that positive connection with them, getting in the moment, giving them our full attention, and kind of not being in a hurry. Right? Even if we only have a little bit of time and we have a lot to do, starting both the first time that we meet some, someone and then each time afterwards, just starting with just kind of being together for a few seconds. Ask how their week was. Check in on their hobbies, their kids. Ask them, you know, how they've been feeling lately and just kind of spend a little time. What's on your mind today? What's going on? How you been? Um, what this does is it helps them bring their whole being into the room and the, this connection with us um, is often what uh, helps foster the intrinsic motivation that we're looking for. Right. So some questions we might have for ourselves. So when I'm engaging, I, I would ask, you know, how comfortable uh, does, does my partner seem to be? Does this person seem to be? How supportive, helpful am I being today, right? Some days I'm tired, it's, I'm not in a good mood, there's other things going on at work, and I need to check you know, myself and make sure in this moment I'm giving it all to the client, right? And as much positive uh, perspective as I can. Right? Do I really understand where they're coming from? Do I understand their concerns? Does it feel like a partnership? So these are the kinds of questions we'll, we'll check in as we're, we're focusing on engaging. With someone being engaged, then we go to focusing. So this is where uh, there's several aspects to this. Some of it is just focusing on what's our task here, what are we trying to achieve. But more importantly, what we're trying to focus on is what is this person's goal? What is their hope? What is their dream? How would they like things to be better? Um, how can they imagine themselves being more fulfilled, being more satisfied? Right? So it's not just about, you know, okay, we're here to get you in a job and let's talk about the skills you have and the interests and let's get you going and get you matched up to something. Right? But trying to tie in a little bit more deeply to how does this aspect fit in the person's life. So some of the aspects here, sometimes people are unclear. They don't even have a clear sense of what they want to do. Other times it's really picking like on this uh, graphic here between two pathways and trying to help them focus which direction do you want to go in. Right? Some of the questions we might have for ourselves as we're focusing, um, is this person even clear on what we do here in VR? Is this person clear of, of what, our, uh, what services we have to offer, how we can help them, what things we might refer out for? Um, are they struggling to decide, right? And if they're struggling to decide, I don't want to move ahead with planning, right? I want to focus, let's, let's sit in this for a moment and get, get our focus. And then this thing, are we dancing or are we wrestling, right? How does it feel in the moment? Does it feel like we're partnering, we're kind of dancing together, like on a, a ballroom floor? Or does it feel like I'm using pressure, that, or like somehow I feel like they're not getting it and I'm trying to point it out to them, or they're not motivated and I'm trying to uh, motivate them from the outside. So these are all questions that we can have for ourselves when we're doing focusing. The third process is evoking. So with the relationship established, with a clear uh, topic that we're focusing on, 
Now what I want to do is take some time and really elicit why they want to do this, what's in it for them, how they see it fitting with their values, how it can make their life better. Um, and then I want to elicit more about how could you be more confident? How could you do this in a way that you're going to feel good about? Um, and then finally help them develop some sense of readiness. I'm ready to give this a shot now. Some of the questions for ourselves when we're evoking, right? What is the client's reasons for what are what, what are his or her own reasons for change? What are their reasons for change? Right. Um, when do they feel at their best? How do they feel the most confident? How can I help them get to that point? Right? And am I the one who's like arguing for change? Am I trying to convince them to do something? Um, because if I am, I've fallen out of evoking and instead I'm providing or, or, or kind of coming from the outside and pushing a little bit. And so I want to step back. So what we're doing here is you can see we're kind of going into the center, right? So some of the ways uh, we might focus on evoking with people is to elicit their values and really just spend a little bit of time, um, you know, what's important to you? What makes you tick? What's the legacy you want to be, leave behind? What do you want to accomplish? Um, how do you want to be a role model for your kids? Or you know, how can you best look up to yourself? Right? So it's really just having a little bit of this, this conversation that's deeper and helping embed the tasks that we're doing and kind of um, the whole person that we're working with. Right? We can also be specific about the tasks. So what do you value most about working? Right? Tell me about what you see yourself, how do you see yourself contributing? What do you have to offer? What, you know, what is, um, what is most important to you as you move forward and think about different jobs that you might have? Right. So the second area there is strengths. Right? So value is about the importance of ch change. Strengths is about confidence towards change. And just spending a little time with them. What, do you, you know, what are your strengths? What gets you through hard times? What's something that you notice you find it a little easier to do than other people seem to? Right? And then spending some time getting them into that kind of mind state and heart state of feeling confident, feeling strong. Um, and then with MI, we're always interested in looking to the future. Right? So how can you take those strengths that you have and apply them to the task that we're doing here? Or how can you get up tomorrow and really leverage your strengths to move forward down this pathway towards the life you want? A few other conversations we might have or things we might focus on. One is evocative question. This is just spending some time trying to evoke from them. You see the examples here. Right. What are some of your best memories uh, in past jobs? Tell me about some of the good times you had at work. Tell me about when you felt the most proud about an achievement or accomplishment. Right. What was it like for you? And really get somebody kind of thinking that way and feeling that way, uh, positively. Um, how do you see your work contributing? Right. How does it contribute to your happiness, your fulfillment, who you are? So just asking these kind of questions, again, they may not always be directly towards the purpose of finding and, and placing someone in a job, but they get somebody engaged. Uh, we can use scaling rulers, right? So importance or confidence scaling. Um, on a scale of zero to 10, right? how important is it to you to make this change, to get this job, to kind of get this new career direction or to go back to school? How important is this? And you can ask the same thing about confidence on a scale of 0 to 10. How confident are you that if you, you know, you'll put in the effort and you'll really try that this could work out for you? Now, the way we can use importance and confidence uh, rulers, one is to, to gauge what should we work on now. Right? So some things very important to someone, uh, but they don't feel confident about it, then you know where we need to focus, right? We don't need to focus on why you should do it. Let's focus on what strengths, how can you go about it, what are some first steps you can take to get more ready for this challenge ahead. And the flip side, if, something, if somebody feels very confident but it's not important, then there's no point trying to push forward to, to them doing it. Right? If it's not very important, we need to kind of stop and go revisit what would make it more important. Now, another way I use importance rulers uh, is to um, Focus the conversation accordingly, right? So how important is it to you to get this specific job? Well, that may be low. But if I broaden the conversa or the question a little bit, well, how important is it to you get, get a, any job or get a career going, get back to work? So that may go up a bit. How important is it to you to really feel like you're moving forward in rehabilitation 
in your recovery in movement towards the life you want. So I'll use, I'll kind of adjust the, the scale or the focus of the question to find what's most important and then uh, obviously want to frame things that way going forward because that's going to bring forth that internal motivation. Now either of these rulers uh, we follow with a downward question. So why is it this number and not something lower? Why is uh, getting a job a five to you and not a zero? I mean, what, what makes it that important to you? And so what we're doing when we ask this downward uh, question is we're listening change talk, right? We're listening somebody saying why it's important to them, um, how things similarly have helped them in the past, you know, how things will be better if they move forward. We're the same thing with confidence. We ask, you know, why, you know, what makes your confidence a six and not a two? Right? Or a six and not a zero. They'll say, well, I'm confident because I know in the past I have, when I haven't been sure what I'm doing, if I put my effort to it, uh, that I'll make it work, or whatever. The, so we do this uh, and we um, elicit change talk. With confidence, not with importance, but with confidence, there's also another follow-up question, which is, what might bump it up a couple? Right? What might bump you from, let's say, a four to a six? And now what somebody's doing is they're giving you basically a treatment plan. Right? Here's what would help me, here's what helped me feel more confident. So you go forward and focus on that with them. So the last bit here is uh, envisioning. And what this is, is instead of just talking about something, asking somebody to actually put you in the moment. Let's imagine, if you're willing with me, um, tell me what your ideal job would be like. What's it going to be like when you're working and you're really confident and you're feeling great about uh, your life and you're happy you made this choice? Um, and you're feeling really good. And what I'll ask people often to do is, put me in the moment. Just talk to me like you're in that moment right now and just share what does it feel like, who's around you, what kind of relationships do you have at work, what do you feel good about, what are you proud about, but just tell me like it's happening right now. This often will help take people kind of out of their heads and into their hearts. And when they do that, um, you know, they're, they're, it brings out more of that internal or intrinsic motivation to, to change and to move forward. Okay, the last bit we have here is the last process is planning, right? So planning is something we're all very familiar with and you don't need me to tell you more about, right? Setting out steps, laying out, uh, kind of organizing things, figuring out what comes first, what comes next. Um, in motivational interviewing, we have these specific uh, questions that sometimes we'll use or ways to frame it, right? Go back, let's again, let's say, what is the specific change you want to make right now? Could be go to school, get a job, could be build a career. You know, what, what are the important reasons? Why do you want to do this? What are you going to get out of it? Let's talk a little bit about what might get in the way, who could help you, what do you see as the first step, the next step? And one of the important things is how will you know if the plan is working? Right? So one thing that happens is people start to make changes and they discount their forward progress and they don't notice it. So helping them measure that or anchor that and keep track of how will you know that you're actually moving forward helps with that part of motivation that's persistence, right? Helps them keep going even after they get started. Despite all this detail, you can boil it down to this core strategy. You could, this is something you could just kind of keep in front of you, is, right? What are these four uh, processes that we have, right? Engaging, focusing, evoking, planning. And you can run a single conversation this way and just kind of step through it. Um, if you wish. So you can also just engage with people naturally and kind of keep in your mind to be listening for change talk, listening for um, progress towards the future, um, and that can be helpful uh, as well. So I hope this has been uh, helpful as an overview um, on how we use uh, motivational interviewing in, in Voc Rehab, um, and thank you for your time.